Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in water conservation, or energy, or entrepreneurship, or even public service, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest has innovated an online marketplace for water in the most remarkable way. And he's a former speechwriter in the George W. Bush administration and so much more. But before I introduce you to Joshua Adler, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays with an overview of the guests we're going to be featuring that week. Please head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four coffee.org and sign up. And while you're on the homepage, if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see that we've organized all the T4C episodes we've released to date by career. So if you're interested in hearing from other professionals in the field of energy and the environment, just click on that box. Or perhaps it's public affairs or public relations. You're welcome to click on those boxes too. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of a delicious caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my multi-talented next guest is Joshua Adler, a successful entrepreneur, angel investor, and veteran dealmaker who has founded energy, real estate, medical technology, and internet companies. And he served as a senior U.S. economic policy official for President George W. Bush. Josh is currently the founding chief executive of SourceWater, the online marketplace and data hub for water in the energy ecosystem, which he conceived while he was at the MIT or Massachusetts Institute of Technology Energy Ventures Program. SourceWater has created the first online marketplace for sourcing, recycling, transporting, and disposing of water for energy, industry, and agriculture. And if you're interested in learning more about Source Water and how Josh built this business from the groundwater up, among the other businesses he's built, please tune in to the main T4C interview I did with him, which may or may not have dropped ahead of this interview. You can just check out the show notes for this episode to see whether or not it's already out there. Josh, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am, Andrea. Thank you. What is your favorite caffeinated beverage? Well, when I have time in the morning at home and I'm not in a rush to get up, I'll grind some coffee beans from a bag and put it in a a Chemex, one of these Chemex glass pots, and it feels special because you go (laughs) through the whole process. But I would say when I'm uh, in a hurry, I usually grab a cold brew out of the fridge or uh, the nearby coffee shop, my favorite is a spicy mocha, which is a mocha with cayenne pepper on it, which gives it some extra kick. Wow, yum. We should let our listeners know that you're joining us from Houston. I don't know if that is a Texas thing. You know, I've never really seen it anywhere besides <laughs> at this particular shop, and it's so good. I'm surprised it hasn't spread more widely, but yeah. I don't know that I should give their secrets away. Well, listen, <laughs> I- I'm guessing there aren't that many people maybe who want to put cayenne pepper in their coffee. <laughs> so, so Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Let us jump right into the 10 espresso shots. These are quick questions to help our young listeners get a better sense of how to break into your industry which is the energy sector, and in particular, it's business-to-business software as a service in the energy sector. So what entry-level jobs are available to young people who want to break into this field? Well, we're doing a fair amount of hiring right now, so this is definitely on my mind. One area of entry-level job is definitely sales or sales development rep. And there, there's a lot of opportunities, but they tend to churn pretty quickly because not too many people have the perfect personality fit for making 100 phone calls a day and often not reaching somebody on the other side or getting rejected. There's, there's certain people who love that, 
and there's a lot of people who don't. So that's in one area on the sales side. On the development and coding side, there's always opportunities for good software developers who often may be very recent graduates, but it's something where it's been a hobby of theirs, so they can be very skilled at it, even if they've just graduated. And then there's a whole big area today that's a real growth area, which maybe we'll talk a little more about, which is data engineering and data analytics, which is an area where it's hard to get good people uh, because there's not that many trained in it. But it's a hot area where there's a lot of opportunity. And somebody who has either just graduated from college or just graduated from graduate school with a master's degree, you know, probably has a lot of opportunity in front of them for that. Terrific. Josh, what is a useful skill or skills that you look for in the people that you hire at SourceWater? Well, there's the functional skills where we need to figure out, is someone actually good at the thing that they're saying they're good at? And you'd be surprised how hard that is to do when you're on the hiring side of these positions. So, and I don't have the perfect answer for that. It's quite difficult to figure out whether somebody is actually going to be good at the thing that you're hiring for that they have asked to do. But in terms of skills more generally, definitely persistence and a hard work and loyalty. And what I mean by loyalty is not that you're uh, going to, you know, not kind of Game of Thrones style. Uh, That's what know, I was thinking. <laughs> not Godfather like, right? Like, like <laughs> will you march into the dragon's flames for your, you know, bannermen? But rather, it's it's concerning if you see someone's resume and they've done lots of different jobs in a very short time, because I would say the number one challenge that we have with hiring entry level or junior people is that if they're if they're smart uh, and they work hard, you expect that it's going to take some time for them to learn to do well what you want them to do, but you expect they're going to learn it. The problem that you run into is if they then leave and go do something else after you've spent three to six months helping them to get good at the thing you need them to do, that's really the worst because you then spent a lot of staff time and your time instead of doing something else or helping someone else prepare, teaching them to do the thing you need, and then they're gone. And that person doesn't necessarily view that as it's not a, a betrayal. It's, you know, that was interesting. I learned some things. I'm ready to learn a different thing. Or, you know, I saw this other opportunity. But it's really painful for the organization to lose time on the senior side training and then have to do it all over again with the next person. It, it takes almost anybody six months to really get good at whatever the thing is that they're starting to do, whether they're you know, new or experienced. That's an issue we've run into many times and, and definitely is something we are trying to figure out better ways to screen for because that's like the most inefficient aspect. Definitely. I was going to say I interviewed the head of the American Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank here in D.C. His name is Dr. Arthur Brooks. He's an economist like you. And one of the things that he said is based on research, it shows that it really takes about 18 months for someone to settle into a new job. So that's just kind of a good thing for our young listeners to keep in the back of their heads if they're feeling like, eh, this job after six months, six months isn't something I love, they should give it more time before they really make that determination. Yeah, I um, I agree with that. And there's always going to be, uh, it's like your, your freshman year of college, you know, everybody has this uh, down period at the end of your first semester or sometime as you get into January or February, or there's some, there's some term for it. There's always going to be ups and downs when you're starting something new and you wonder if you fit in or if you're going to get good at it or feels like you're not very good at it. But it, it just everything takes time and it takes more time than you expect it will. And that's an important, uh, that's important experience. It's also an important calculation when you're doing something. And as an employer, you know, when I think about the big issues we've run into hiring a lot of people over the last few years, that's got to be the biggest one mm. is the very promising, promising people who we're excited about, who say they're going to do something, start to do it. And then for 
somewhat arbitrary reasons or no reasons decide it's time for them to try doing something else and they don't really understand the impact that has on the organization. So that comes back to loyalty as a, I don't know if loyalty is a skill, but it's a... An attribute. uh, Yes. So, Josh, is someone's major a deciding factor to get into this line of work broadly? In other words, if they haven't studied fill in the blank, is it a deal breaker? It depends very much on the functional area that we're talking about. So for sales, definitely not. I would say that somebody's experience either doing sales as a job in college, making whether it's door to door, working in a cell phone store, selling a lot of plans, that that's important. Also, if they have experience in highly competitive athletics, that's a really good indicator for success in sales because it takes so much persistence in the face of defeat. For the more technical roles, the major does make a big difference. It would be hard to, for a a junior data science or data engineering or data analyst position, it would be hard to take an applicant seriously if they didn't have a technical degree that was relevant there, for sure. Same with software coding. Definitely. What about a graduate school degree? And you've already alluded to that, even for some of the entry-level positions, that that may be something that you're already looking for. But I'm guessing, again, it has to do with the functional aspects of the job. Absolutely. For the technical positions, a master's degree is often important in the data, in the technical data roles like data engineer and data analyst or data scientist. For software coding, much less common, not as important. A lot of people go into very productive software development careers with just an undergraduate degree. Some people don't even have that, but they're savants who have been coding since they were five years old and just, you know, you you see that sometimes with software. Otherwise, I think graduate degree can be important for finance roles and sometimes for certain operations and product roles. If you're going to be doing a lot of financial planning, financial projections, analysis, that's not that common to have learned it at the undergraduate level and is often something that's more like uh, an MBA or, or MS of finance. Got it. What about life experiences? What in your experience, Josh, are the most useful ones for someone who's really trying to break into this field? You mentioned, for example, if they'd played team sports, but are there any others? You know, you want to see someone who's overcome adversity in some way, shape, or form. And I think that's a good indicator for persistence because there's always going to be some adversity in learning something new and doing something new, especially when you're in a startup environment. If it were easy, someone would have already done it. And so someone who's on your team, you want to see that they've that they've worked hard at something in the past. And because of that hard work, they've succeeded in it, which is where sometimes you see that from that competitive sports background. But there's there's a lot of other ways that that may take shape. So you're talking about grit. Yes, exactly. So when you say adversity, what would be an example of a type of adversity that you would say, aha, yeah, this is somebody who has the goods. You know, maybe someone who had a a hard time in school at some point and took a break and went back and and got it done. It might have been the environment they had when growing up uh, that they were in difficult circumstances early on and had to work hard to get to school. Uh, Maybe they got a scholarship. They had challenging family circumstances. Maybe one parent was absent. We're not necessarily getting to that level of detail, but if somebody were to, I'm not going to ask somebody that question in a job interview, but if I ask them, you know, show me, uh, tell me about a time when you 
overcame difficult circumstances or adversity and how did that play out? Maybe they're volunteering that and telling me about that. And that's something where I would say, oh, you know, this is this is somebody who's had to work really hard for something. And that's important because whatever it is that we're doing, it's not going to be easy. And uh, I don't want somebody who gets surprised by that. I find that really interesting to hear you say that about candidates that you're interviewing for entry-level jobs. It would have made more sense to me if we were talking about the kinds of people who you might want to partner with as you go to launch a new startup or something like that. Why is it that that's so important for those junior positions? I just think it's important for everybody in the organization. I don't think it's a high level or low level uh, characteristic. It's it's just the people who you work with, you want them to be resourceful. You're not going to be able to babysit everybody or even at all. And so you need people who, when confronted with a challenge, are going to just figure it out. Having said that, particularly at the entry levels, you also need someone who has the judgment to know when should I ask about this and when should I not waste people's time asking about it. And that's something you have to learn in your early years and into really your middle years of work. I mean, I'll say another characteristic that's helpful is it's good if you see someone has worked in an organization before. And maybe that's a student organization where they had a leadership role, but where they were in a team environment because some people just aren't great at working with other people and maybe bristle at being told what to do or feeling like they have certain constraints on what they can do. And some people are better as just pure individual contributors. And there are roles where there's potential for that. But in most positions, you're working with other people, you're on a team, you need to understand that you need to get the, the cooperation and buy-in and consent from other members of the team and that there's a some type of organizational structure there. And so you're not just doing things in the name of your company or organization that or that don't actually have the approval and authority of the, of the company behind you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for helping to flesh that out a bit more. Josh, what is the best part for you of not only being a serial entrepreneur, but very specifically to what you're doing right now, being an entrepreneur in the energy sector? Hmm. For me, it's that I came up with an idea based on certain observations and principles that no one had ever done before. And after some time thinking about it and asking a lot of questions and researching it, I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And so for me, the whether this or in some of the other entrepreneurial experiences I've had, the best part is solving problems, undertaking challenges and figuring them out and feeling every day like i i moved this a little further forward once in a while a lot further forward usually just a very little bit forward on solving some some problem i didn't expect some challenge that came up it's like the simultaneous like spike of stress like oh no you know what's this you know <laughs> oh, why is this happening why is you know why is everything always so difficult right. and then figuring it out and working with people and getting it done, whether through some combination of work or persuasion or analysis or problem solving, whatever it is. And that's that day to day uh, sort of it's definitely stressful, but the, the, the stressful side with the the little thrills of, of solve that, you know, like we got past that. How do we do that? It wasn't just by being smart. It was by being creative and and persistent. So it's this wide open and, and maybe this is this is more a Josh thing, but being confronted with some particular challenge or that'll never work, or they said no, or it's too expensive, or whatever it is, I like to kind of go uh, sideways a little bit. What I mean is, the, the cliche is think outside the box, but I try to to think creatively about what this challenge is and pull from completely different fields of study or professions or just bring something completely from the outside in and say, what about that? You know, when, when so-and-so did 
this thing that no one's thinking about at all that's completely unrelated. That kind of seems like this situation. Could we try that and go around this instead of going through it or, you know, go over it or under it or whatever it is? And that that creative problem solving every day is is kind of the day to day thing that I find motivating. Yes, I totally get that. And it's the approach that you have, the attitude that you have to that, Josh, which instead of seeing it as a negative, you're seeing it as a, ooh, here's another (laughs) roadblock. Let me see how I can come at this, which leads me to the flip side. So is there a part of your current job that sucks the most? (laughs) Well, you know, I'll say a couple aspects for that. I mean, one is Somewhat unusually, I am both the founder of the company and the CEO, and I'm also the primary investor. So I pay all the bills, I'm paying all the people, and uh, that can get a little stressful. I have a higher tolerance for that kind of stress than almost anyone I've ever met. Um, and, and I know a lot of successful people and, 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 you know, and I'm in investor groups and that sort of thing. And like, they'll look at me and be like, wow, you're really doing it. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> believe me, these are people who are, you know, 10, 50, a hundred times wealthier than I am. And, uh, they're like, man, you're in the game. You know, you're really, you know, you're you go for it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, those functions aren't always combined. And so it does create a certain conflict in the calculation from the standpoint of if my objective were solely to make the business a success as a business, I might, you know, raise as much outside money as I possibly could. I wouldn't really worry about the price or just be like, let's just get this done and burn money. Whereas as an investor wearing the investor hat, it's I want to try to preserve equity value for not just for me, but for the early employees and see how far we can get with the limited resources we have. And that trade-off is is stressful. The other part I would say about the sucks the most is I'm definitely not a natural manager of people. I'm I'm more of a problem-solving, puzzle-solving, creative, analytical, individual contributor by nature, you know. I like to take a hard problem and just work on it and work on it and come up with some amazing answer and be like, look at this amazing thing I, you know, that I did. And I just as soon have everybody do their own thing, you know, <laughs> okay, your job is this, go figure it out. Like, let me know when it's, let me know when it's done. And, and I hope it's great. And that's not always the effective way to be a manager. And so in that balance of, I know I'm supposed to be spending time talking to the people who work for me and, you know, asking about what they're doing and holding them accountable for things. But that's not a natural inclination for me. Yeah, it's always easy to manage the really good employees. Yeah. But not everyone is going to be good. I mean, that doesn't mean to say that they're not proficient in what they're doing, but there may be aspects of not being as much of a team player as they could be or or other pieces that are critical to the success of your of your job. So I totally relate to that. Josh, what is the best career advice you've ever gotten? So <laughs> I've. I've had, I've kind of gone my own road and haven't had much by way of mentors along the way. And, you know, I kind of wish I had, but somehow I've made it to uh, 45 years old, I feel like, without ever having a real job or almost not really having a boss, which is kind of strange. In the first uh, company that I was involved with after college, I helped start a medical device company, and I was the number two person there after the founding CEO, who was much older than me, very experienced. And one of the things he emphasized to me was to, in those early days when I had just graduated college, and I I went to Yale undergrad, and you know I thought I was real smart and knew everything. And he really made a point of 
putting me in situations with people who had different backgrounds from me and and trying to maximize the value and contribution of all the people on the team, even if they couldn't do each thing or any particular thing as well as I might have done it myself if that was the thing I was doing. But in my first year out of college, I was at a I was working in an engineering facility that was developing the the medical device for us. And there were a whole bunch of people there. And one of them had written a, a letter to uh, I don't even remember some outside contractor or some vendor or something like that and asked me to edit the letter. And me being the, you know, consummate writer who later was a speech writer for, you know, a president, but I've just always at least self-esteemed my writing skills, whether appropriately or not. I basically redlined every single word in this letter. And uh, <laughs> just there wasn't, there I'm wasn't sure that went single, over real well. There wasn't a single word in the letter or a single sentence where I would have put it that way. And this caused a little bit of a kerfuffle. And, you know, they weren't too thrilled about the, you know, the kid from Yale or Harvard or who is this old jerk? And, and he gave me some advice at the time. He said, it's not that important for this. This is not a communication that has to be perfect. It's more important that the person you're working with feels like they're making a contribution to the team. And that's, it doesn't need to be the perfect letter as long as it gets the job done. This was not the right response to what he submitted to you for, for editing. You have to judge when something needs to be A plus quality and when maybe that's not the most important aspect of that contribution. Yeah. Also that recognizing that not everyone's going to do things the same way or necessarily the same standard you would yourself, but that's also not necessarily important. If you're going to have the team be fully productive, you can't do everything. That's something I see common to people like me who are kind of high velocity perfectionists about themselves. And then you try to do everything. And that's just not possible. So you have to find ways to work with others and encourage contribution. And that sometimes involves compromises, but that result in a, a greater overall accomplishment for the team. And how wonderful that you got that lesson really early in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you one other lesson, which is a little different, <laughs> which sure. is more of an entrepreneurial lesson, which is when I was in college, my business partner and I, we had this, we'd started this business that was basically the first online matchmaking company. And it's a little more complicated than that, but this was the early 90s. And my business partner, who was a computer science major at Johns Hopkins, uh, we'd gone to high school together and had been good friends in high school. He was basically explaining the internet to me. This was before anybody really outside of computer science had heard of the internet. And he said, there's this thing called the internet and there's this thing called Gopher. This was before the web. Netscape didn't start for another year or two. You know, you can log into other people's computers and run programs and like check out files. And he said, I was thinking maybe we could sell flowers or CDs or books on the internet to other computer science people like me who are just kind of on it all day. And I said to him, Jeremy, we have a, a real business here, this matchmaking business, where we have real customers and there's actually thousands of users and they're paying us not much money, but real money. Let's stay focused. You know, let's focus on the thing that we're doing. Meanwhile, it was the next year that Jeff Bezos started Amazon. <laughs> right. Selling books on the internet. <laughs> my response, my response to Jeremy was, Jeremy, Oops. we're not gonna build a business selling flowers to computer nerds who have no dates. <laughs> 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 that doesn't make any sense. But the, the lesson from that was it's really important to stay focused and it's so easy not to be at the same time. How do you tune your ear to listen to that new opportunity? that maybe you should try that out. You know, maybe that is the better way to go. And that is so, so hard to figure out that balance because anytime you're doing anything, especially entrepreneurially, you're constantly seeing new opportunities. I mean, the, in the business that we're in right now at Sourcewater, we're in this completely new field where there is just nobody else in it. 
And there is so much opportunity to do so many things. And they're coming into us every day. We're getting calls all day from people saying like, hey, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And I'll talk to my COO because he's the one on the phone with all of them. And he'll be like, hey, someone just called and they wanted to do this. And it sounds really interesting. And it's like, look, we got to stay focused. We're getting these all day. But sometimes you got to say, well, let me think about that. That is pretty interesting. And uh, that balance, keeping your ear open the right amount is very challenging. Oh, I can imagine. So two final espresso shots, Josh. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows, speaking of Amazon, or books, do you think accurately depict your profession? And maybe we can widen the aperture just a bit and look at it more as entrepreneurship. (laughs) The easy answer would be Silicon Valley, which uh, you probably get a lot. The harder answer might be Game of Thrones uh, because uh, <laughs> okay. it's uh, it can be pretty uh, tribal out there. And certainly for us, one of the unusual things about source water is that it is a bunch of people, starting with myself, who didn't know anything about the industry that we went into. Nothing. And it's an industry that is particularly, tribal might be too far, it can be somewhat insular, and it certainly has its own language and its own networks. And, and every industry is like that, but this one is, is pretty far in, on the spectrum there. And, and so just learning how things work and who people are and being accepted into it you can't just show up and say, hey, I'm, I'm from MIT and I have the answers. <laughs> that gets rejected real fast. And so learning to speak the language and respect the customs and know the people takes a long time. And no matter how good your solution is or how much you're bringing to the table and time and expertise and investment to help them do their jobs better and create more value. There's a lengthy process of showing that you're serious, showing respect, learn the customs, all those things that is very difficult to accelerate if you are an outsider to it. And that's something I certainly didn't understand at all when I had the original idea to do this. And I'm still learning. Well, and to your Game of Thrones suggestion there, Josh, I think without uh, any spoilers, since at the time of this recording, the last episode has already aired, we can at least say I hope that you are sitting in the Iron Throne at the end of (laughs) wherever you go with source water. (laughs) So final espresso shot, Josh. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession? Well, I'll say two things. One is the, the point I was just making that it's as much as you think that being high tech and software and in this global industry and on the internet is this new thing um, where the world is wide open and there's almost, for what we're doing, there's there's virtually no competition. That's a completely new concept and it makes a ton of sense. The people and relationships and way that you're perceived by your customers who very much talk to each other and are in the same places and are all chattering out there really matters. And so it's easy to maybe be in Silicon Valley or read about uh, businesses like Facebook and Google and think, you know, if you create this awesome online portal that has some great tools and some great design, millions of people are going to flock to this thing. But when you're selling to businesses, uh, even products that seem very simple, even products that seem really low cost hey, this is free and it's going to help you get better information and make better decisions. 
there was an incredibly long adoption period. One of the things that I find that a lot of entrepreneurs in the business to business space misunderstand is that if their product is super cheap or even free, that anyone will use it, that anyone will buy it and try it out. But that's not the real cost. The real cost for that user is, am I going to spend time on something that won't be around in six months or a year? Am I going to invest in changing the way that I have done things and learned to do things and everyone else does them this way for years and years and years for some kid who's telling me that he's got some new better way who doesn't know anything about the way we do things or why we do them that way. And, you know, it's not the cost is not the price for a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars per year to buy your thing. The cost is the cost in the time and change and buy-in of changing the way an organization does things from the way they've been doing them which is enormously hard to do, even in the smaller organizations. And when you get to the big ones, it's crazy. There's like thousands of people who have to agree on your thing. And nobody cares that much because the way they're doing it, eh, it's good enough. It's been working for a long time. Who wants to mess with it? Who's going to take that on? And so I would say that the, the big surprise is how hard it is, how much time and investment and and education and training and just and socializing and, you know, getting trust and support from the medium to large size organizations you have to do to get any kind of complex business to change the way they do things. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the price or effectiveness of your product. And that's really, that is a huge eye opener that a lot of people with some new technology or great idea do not understand at all. They think it's, hey, you know, if I can raise 100000 or 200000 or $500,000, I can get a couple of coders, I can build this thing in six months, it's going to be amazing, we're going to make it free, a ton of people are going to be on there, and then we're going to start charging them premium, premium pricing next year and blah, blah, blah. That is just not how it works at all when you're in the world of big business heavy industry. They only care about the downside. There, there is no upside. There's only what's the risk to my career? What's the risk to my organization if we change the way we do things to take on your little thing that might not be here next year? And that's a completely different mode of thinking for most people who are coming out of college or starting a little tech company it's a much bigger challenge than I ever imagined. And it's something that's hard to understand if you haven't been in these big organizations before. Wow. That is such great insight, Josh. And I heard a couple of common threads that really bring us back to the very beginning of this conversation. The importance of trust, not only that you're junior staff will stay with you, but the importance of building trust with your business clients and the importance of grit, again, not only among your entry-level staff, but holy cow, certainly for the founder and your leadership team, because this ain't easy. That's absolutely right, Andrea. I mean, I'm better part of six years into it now, and we're seeing we're seeing a lot of great commercial traction in the last six months. We finally figured out the thing that everybody wants, and now it's going really, really well. But we, one, we had to hit a lot of dead ends over the last five plus years to figure that out. And it's I actually heard a great expression for it just last week. I happened to be at a a lunch event where the founder of Waze was the lunch speaker. He's an Israeli guy and he's started a whole bunch of companies now, but this is somebody who's been involved in a ton of startups, started a hugely successful one that you know, we sold for over a billion dollars to Google. And the phrase he used was, he called it the journey of failure. And the question he was asked was, so when one of your companies that you've invested in gets really successful, what just stops everybody else from copying it? 
because this stuff's all online. You know, somebody can see what they're doing and just build the same thing that took you years and a couple of months. And his response to that was the journey of failure. Unless you know exactly why everything is the way it is from having tried everything else and failed along the way, you'll never be able to copy it and take it forward because you'll just go the wrong way from there. And it, that really resonated with me because we've certainly had our journey of failure and to get to where we are now. And one of the aspects of that journey of failure was understanding not just that product market fit, but exactly what you just said, which is developing trust with all these clients and a reputation that we're going to keep working, we're going to keep trying, that we're going to make it better for you, that we're still going to be here. And I almost feel like one of the key reasons why we're seeing a lot of success now is because we just kept showing up. And there were so many companies, I saw this in my real estate experience during the Great Recession as well, but in the energy industry, there was this huge collapse in 2015 and 2016 where tons of companies after a big, big boom just got wiped out. And we kept going because me, Josh, the founder said, this is still a big opportunity. And even though no investor is going to invest in the energy industry right now, I'm going to keep doing it. And we're going to keep going. And it's going to come out of my pocket because I know there's still a big opportunity here and we're going to keep working on it. And so once we got through that time period, I started to see a different receptivity from clients, potential customers. And I, I got the feeling that part of it was, hey, you know what? They're si they see that we're still here and they're saying they must be doing something right because they're still here. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's, let's, let's meet with them again for the third time or the fifth time or the 10th time. We haven't seen them in a couple of years and see what they're up to. And, um, and I think it is that, that developing that trust that we're really in it because a lot of people show up yeah, and I've seen it now, having been this industry for five years, you see some kids show up and he or she is talking about their great new thing. And you're like, yeah, you're not going to be here next year. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, you're the old no timer idea. now. You have no idea. <laughs> you know. And I see that. I see I go to these startup competitions and the pitch contests. And I'm like, you have no idea what you're getting into. And I realize that's the people in the business are saying about us, right? They're like, yeah, someone's coming along. Tell them, you know what? This business been going on for over 100 years. You ain't going to change it. Yeah. And, uh, but you can. But it really takes time because there's a very big people element. It's not just coming up with a new thing and then everyone loves it. I think it's so wonderful that the advice and the picture painted by the head or the founder of Waze, the journey of failure that he talked about, Josh, comes from somebody whose app is all about getting where you need to go as quickly as possible and mm. not hitting those roadblocks <laughs> that you need to be able to pivot when you reach a detour and you still need to get where you're going. But I can't wait to get into how you've gotten where you're going in your career in our longer T4C interview, which again, check out show notes Java Junkies to see if it has already aired. Josh, thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. This has been so interesting. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's been great. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.